Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this session. Uh, my name is Yoshiki Tabata, and I work at OSS Solution Center of Hitachi. Today, I'd like to talk about exploring best practices for implementing authentication and authorization in a cloud native environment. Authentication and authorization is uh, some, of the, some of the most important considerations for cloud native applications, but they are very difficult to implement due to the many excellent implementations and the wide range of related specifications, including OWASP and OpenID Connect. Today, I want to discuss the basics of authentication and authorization, current trends, and explore best practices for implementing authentication and authorization. These are today's contents. First, I describe the difficulties, difficulty of implementing authentication and authorization. Then, I introduce current trends in authentication and authorization. After that, I describe best practices for designing authentication and authorization. Finally, we explore best practices for implementing authentication and authorization. I plan to give a demonstration. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Yoshiki Tabata, and I'm a senior OSS consultant at Hitachi. I'm also a CNSF ambassador, and an organizer of Cloud Native Community Japan and the founder of Cloud Native Security Japan. I mainly work as a specialist in identity and access management and the API, and I have consulted in designing API and authentication and authorization platforms for about 10 years. And I'm also a con community contributor. Uh, currently, I'm contributing actively to CNSF Tag Security and also, I contributed some important functions to OSS, such as Keycloak and OSS for identity and access management. Regarding other activities, I have given talks at events such as KubeCon, API Days, All Day DevOps, and so on. I also have written some books and web articles about Keycloak and IAM, and hosted some CNSF meetups in Japan. So let's get back to the main topic. First, I describe the difficulty of implementing authentication and authorization. First of all, what is authentication and authorization? Authentication is the process of verifying the entity's identity. And authorization is the process of verifying that a requested action or service is approved for a specific entity. Briefly speaking, authentication is the answer to the question, who or what does request resources? Authorization is the answer to the question, can the entity take some action regarding resources? The important point is, although these two are often confused, but authentication and authorization are completely different. Authentication and authorization are some of most important considerations for cloud native applications. This is clear from the OWASP top 10 API security risks. The top three, risk, top three security risks are regarding authentication and authorization. Number one is broken object level authorization. Number two is broken authentication. And number three is broken object property level authorization. Also number five security risks regarding authorization, broken function level authorization. I break down the authorization security risks a little more in the next slide. Uh, how many people know the differences between these three authorization security risks? Authorization is important, but there are many different levels, and this complexity is one of the factors that make it difficult to implement authorization. I briefly explain each authorization security risk. Regarding number one, broken object level authorization, this risk allows access to object not permitted. For example, user 101 can get user 102's resources. The resource server must not allow user 101 to obtain user 102's resource. Regarding number three, broken object property level authorization, this risk allows access to object properties not permitted. For example, a general user 101 
can change its rank to gold rank. The resource server must not allow a general user to change sensitive object properties like rank. And finally, regarding number, number five broken function level authorization, this risk allows access to prohibited functions. For example, a general user 101 can call administrator functions. The resource server must not allow a general user to call administrator functions. As you can see, these are various levels of authorization, all of which are considered high security risks. This highlights the importance of authorization. Let's take a look at the standards and imp implementations regarding authentication. Regarding authentication, there are various standards. And this year is the 10th anniversary of the release of OpenID Connect 1.0. Especially around OpenID Connect 1.0.1 and its base of 2.0, in recent years, various standards have been published to address various attacks and social needs. And more will likely increase in the future. This figure shows only part of them. For example, FAPI has been widely used, which is a hardened version of OIDC and OWASP. And OID for VCI has also been attracting attention recently, which is suitable for models of decentralized identifier and verifiable credentials. Outside of OIDC, SAMU might be also often heard as an authentication specification. And web authentication has been also attracting attention recently, which is the basis of passkeys. Here I only pick out user authentication, but in cloud native environment, workload authentication is also an important consideration. As you can see, it is a little difficult just to catch up on authentication standards. Representative OSS is in the authentication field includes Keycloak, Dex, Spire, and so on. So how about authorization? Authorization is different from authentication. There are no standards for communicating authentication information. But there are a lot of excellent OSS. In such a situation, the choice of authorization implementation becomes difficult because the implementation becomes more dependent on a specific OSS. However, the good news is that currently, OIDF OSS and working group is working to develop standards to address this situation. Representative OSS in the authorization field includes Open Policy Agent OPA, OpenFGA, Topaz, SpiceDB, and so on. So far, I have described the difficulties of implementing authentication and authorization. Next, I introduce current trends in authentication and authorization. First, the current trends of authentication. As I said before, in a cloud native environment, not only user authentication like OIDC, but also workload authentication is becoming increasingly important. In today's world, with an increased number of complex software functions being built and deployed as workloads, IETF Workload Identity in Multi-System Environment Working Group, WIMZ Working Group, was established in 2024 and is developing standards for workload authentication. In particular, in the context of zero trust network architecture, this workload authentication has attracted a lot of attention. The WIMZ working group published three internet drafts. First, uh, WIMZ service to service authentication, published on August 15th, describes protocols for two workloads to verify each other's identity. Workload identity in a multi-system environment architecture, published July 8th, describes workload identity and its use cases. Best current practice for OS 2.0 client authentication in workload environments, published July 8th, described the 
OS 2.0 client authentication method in workload environments, utilizing service account token volume projection and RFC 7523. That is JSON Web Token Profile for all 2.0 client authentication and authorization grant. Demand for workload authentication and the activity of the WMZ working group is both increasing, so we will need to keep an eye on this going forward. Next, the current trend of authorization. As I said before, uh, authorization is recognized as one of the most important security risks, and there is a demand for dynamic and fine-grained authorization schemas. OIDF Authorization Exchange Working Group, or then Working Group, was published, uh, no, was established in 2023 and is developing standards for authorization. This Auth then Working Group published one draft. There is Authorization API 1.0, published September 15th. Describe, this is, this describes API specification between policy decision points, PDP, and policy enforcement points, PEP. Currently, uh, regarding authorization, various excellent OSS exchange data using their original interface specifications, but it is expected that this activity towards standardization of authorization will be gradually related to common interfaces. So we will need to continue to keep an eye on this too. So next, I describe best practices for designing authentication and authorization. Uh, it can be difficult to know where to start designing authentication and authorization, but let's start with user authentication. First, assess the adverse impact of failures and choose the appropriate user authentication method among the many available following NIST SP863 digital identity guidelines. Currently, revision four of NIST SP863 uh, is available as a draft. This document allows you to assess the adverse impact of failures and determine authenticator auth authenticator assurance levels. For example, this document said that to make PII available online, AAL2 or higher is required. After decided AAL, we will select user authentication method. For example, in AAL1, single factor authentication like password authentication is permitted. In AAL2, Multi-factor authentication, like synced passkey based on W3C web authentication, is needed. And in AA3, multi-factor cryptographic authentication, like device bound passkey based on web authentication, is required. It is a little difficult to implement user authentication in workload individually, but uh, workloads do not need to implement user authentication themselves. User authentication is indeed commonly delegated to an identity provider, IEP, such as Keycloak. This approach simplifies the implementation of authentication in workloads by centralizing the authentication process. When delegating user authentication, it is important to choose the appropriate federation protocol following the guideline outlined in NIST SP863. Like AAL, Federation Assurance Levels, FAL, has three levels. And we select the suitable one by assessing the adverse impact of failures. After deciding on FAL, we will select Federation Protocols. For example, in FAL1, OIDC Implicit Flow is permitted. In FAL2, OIDC Authorization Code Flow is needed. In FAL3, some kind of folder of key ID token is required. And when adapting OIDC, it is essential to decide on more specific implementation by following the OS 2.0 security best current practice, which summarize, summarizes the latest security recommendations for OS 2.0. 
Since OAuth 2.0 is the foundation of OIDC, the document is also applic applicable to OIDC. Among federation protocols, OIDC and some are well known. However, OIDC is open, often preferred for cloud-native environments due to its high affinity and its basis on OAuth 2.0, the standard for API protection. In OS 2.0 security best kind practices, there are three examples and their mitigations. For example, to mitigate cross-site request forgery, we can adapt RFC 7636 proof key for code exchange, PIXI. To mitigate misuse of a stolen access token, we can adapt RFC 8705 OS 2.0 mutual TLS client authentication and certi certificate bound access tokens, or RFC 9449 OS 2.0 demonstrating proof of position, DPOP. Like this, it is recommended to make the federation protocol secure according to OS 2.0 security best guard practices. Next, uh, we will look at workload authentication best practices. As I introduced the current trend section, currently Wimuzi Working Group discusses workload authentication using JOT, so it may increase adoption in the future. But the current mainstream is M uh, MTRS authentication using X509 certificates with a spiffy compliant implementation such as Spire. And there are several ways to interact with Spire agent, including implementing its client with Spiffy library, using Spire helper utility, or using Envoy proxy. This figure shows the last one using Envoy proxy. If using Envoy proxy, we do not need to take care of workload authentication when implementing the workload because the workload implementation doesn't interact with the Spawire agent directly and delegates workload authentication to Envoy Proxy. Instead, of course, we need to deploy Envoy Proxy. Next, I will look at authorization best practices. First, we separate authorization logic from application logic using the PXP architecture defined in XACML and NIST SP800-162 that is guide to attribute-based access control definition and considerations. By separating the authorization logic, workloads are freed from having to keep up with the complexity of authorization conditions as the service grows. In this architecture, first, PEP receives an unauthorized request from subject and delegates authorization to PDP. Then PDP makes an authorization decision using policies from a PAP and data from PIP and send a response to PEP. After that, if the decision is true, PEP makes an unauthorized request to the object, and then responds to the result to the subject. The one of the key points is selecting the authorization model. Depending on your use case, choose the PDP authorization model between attribute-based access control ABAC and relationship-based relationship access control REBAC. Currently, these two authorization methods, ABAC and REBAC, are mainstream. This is a brief comparison between ABAC and REBAC. ABAC, sometimes called policy as code, is good at very fine-grained authorization, including depending on dynamic attributes such as time and location. For example, ABAC is suitable if your authorization conditions are as follows. Managers who are in ABAC can view trade con confidential files during business hours, like this. Representative or implementation of ABAC is the policy, open policy agent, OPA. On the other hand, REBAC, sometimes calls, called policy as graph, is good at authorization using complex 
hierarchical relationships. For example, rework is suitable if your authorization conditions are as follows. Users who are assigned the member role of the development team will also be granted the edit role for all files in that holder if the development team is the parent of that holder, like this. The representative implementation of Rework is OpenFCA. This is just a simple comparison, and I hope that this information will help you in some way in selecting an authorization model. But in practice, we will need to spend more time carefully examining the appropriate authorization model. Next, uh, we focus on interfaces between PDP and PEP. As I introduced in the current trend section, we should implement the, the interfaces between PDP and PEP following OIDF Auth Then Working Group Authorization API 1.0. This is because um, many OSS participate in OSZEN initiatives, and it is expected that many OSS will align with OSZEN specifications. However, since this specification is still a draft, so it is possible to break changes, so it is necessary to keep a close eye on trends. Finally, uh, we will change our perspective a little and focus on how to obtain user identities. In the PXP architecture, user attributes can be obtained from sources such as PIP, but how do we obtain the information to identify the entity? The typical way is following RFC 7662 OS 2.0 token introspection. Token introspection uses access tokens which are obtained from API requests from the entity. Entities typically request API with an OS access token following RFC 6750 OS 2.0 better token usage. Then the resource server requests the token introspection endpoint with the access token, and the authorization server receives the access token and sends meta information including the user identity. This is a typical way to obtain user identities. Note that this is a simple single resource server environment. So how about the multiple workload environment? In a cloud native environment, the workload may need to interact with others. In this case, obtaining a new token following RSC 8693, or 2.0 token exchange, and use a new token within a trusted domain. More detailed speaking, once the workload receives an access token, requests exchange the access token to new token following RFC 8693. If the workload obtains the new token, the workload uses a token to request downstream workload APIs. Implementing, to implementing token exchange like this provides two benefits. First, it enhances privacy by preventing personal information from leaking outside of the trusted domain. Second, it improves authorization by allowing downstream workloads to obtain more detailed information from JOT on upstream workload. Currently, the IETF Auth Working Group is discussing this interaction as transaction tokens, and its activities are beneficial for this situation. Then, how about the multiple trusted domain environment? If workloads are distributed across multiple trusted domains, we need to obtain a new token for the other trusted domain following RFC 8693, which is OS 2.0 token exchange, and RFC 7523, JOT profile for OS 2.0 authorization grants. More detailed speaking, once the workload receives an access token, request ex Request exchange the access token to an authorization grant JOT for RFC 8693. Then the workload obtains an authorization grant JOT. The workload uses the JOT to get a new access token for RFC 7523. Then the workload obtains a new access token. And finally, the workload uses the token to request downstream workload APIs. 
Currently, the IETF-OS working group is discussing the interaction as OS identity and authorization chaining across domains, and its activities are beneficial for this situation. Finally, we explore best practices for implementing authentication and authorization. Based on the best practices for designing authentication and authorization explained so far, we try to integrate Keycrock as an authorization server and OPA or OpenFGA as the PDP, and realize one simple authentication and authorization implementation model. This figure shows the data. First, Keycrock issues an access token by following RFC 6749 OS 2.0 authorization framework. Then the entity requests APIs, APIs with the access token by following RFC 6750 OS 2.0 bearer token usage. And finally, the resource server, we use NGX, delegates authorization to OPA or OpenFGA. First, uh, I briefly introduce Keycrock. Keycrock is an identity and access management OSS, and Keycrock provides OS 2.0 authorization server features and single sign-on features. Keycrock is a sensitive incubating project. Here I introduce three major features. First, Keycrock supports standards protocols, such as OS 2.0, OpenID Connect, SAML, and so on. Second, Keycrock can log in with social networks, such as GitHub, X, Facebook, and so on. Finally, Keycrow can connect to existing user stores such as LDAP, Active Directory, and so on. The Keycrow community is indeed vibrant and active, driven by many excellent developers. This strong community involvement makes Keycrow an outstanding identity and access management OSS. So let's move back to the integration. There are two key points for this integration. First, how to delegate authorization. Second, how to provision attributes to be used for authorization. Regarding the first one, we recommended following the authorization API in the previous section. So we'll, we'd like to verify how much these two OSS can follow the authorization API standard. Regarding the second one, this is a somewhat new perspective. When PDP uses user attributes to make authorization decisions, it needs to obtain user attribute information from the IAM solution. Therefore, we'd like to verify how these two OSS obtain information. Before moving on the demonstration, I first explain the result of our verification. Regarding Keycrock OPA integration, to delegate authorization, we can use OPA's original REST API, which allows parameters to be similar to those of the authorization API to some extent. To provision attributes, one solution is option four, push data for external data, data usage described in OPA document. In that case, it is recommended to use ecosystems such as Styler, Enterprise OPA, or OPA. This time, uh, we didn't verify the integration using ecosystem other than OPA. Next, uh, regarding Keycrock OpenFGA integration, to delegate authorization, we can use OpenFGA's check API, which is completely original. And to, pre to provision attributes, we can use OpenFGA's write API, which is also completely original. To call the write API from Keycrock, we prepare the Keycrock event listener SPI provider that calls the right API when attributes are changed in Keycrock. These are the summary of the feature of both solutions. So let's demonstrate. First, I show the parts of this environment. 
Uh, there are key clock ports and also NGX ports. NGX is used as workload and PP. And there is an OPER port and OpenFCA port. That is the PDP ports. And services are like this. I use uh, Minikube in this demonstration. So I use this kubectl uh, port forward uh, to export the, each services, services port and use them. And so I show you the NCNX configuration. Just a moment. Maybe this is okay. In NGX, there are two endpoints. First is the hello endpoint, and second is hello two endpoint. And hello endpoint uses the OPA for authorization, and hello two endpoint uses the OpenFZA for authorization. And uh, each uh, location directive uh, calls, calls, for example, OPA calls uh, this OPA original endpoint and similar to the uh, parameters of the authorization API. And when OpenFZA uh, calls this check API, this is a completely uh, original API for of the OpenFZA. And what, uh, what I try to uh, achieve the authorization is uh, first uh, share to the PDP the user identifier as user ID. And also, second parameter is resource that uh, indicate the resource of the, this endpoint. So if OPER, that is a hollow. And if OpenFGA, that is a hollow too. And finally, the uh, send uh, action. The action name is, uh, in this demonstration, uh, can read action. Oh, NGX uh, configuration is like this. So let's test the first OPA integration. The OPA's policy is like this. Maybe the small letter, but uh, yes. Uh, we already defined the user, uh, two users, and if the user, the uh, user group is admin, and resource type is hello, and action name is can read, then hello is true. I show the key clock uh, administration console. This uh, in this demonstration. Uh, we use the key clock as the what? Key note, okay. No. Okay. We use a test realm and we prepare the test user. And the test user's ID is B5 blah, blah, blah. That is uh, this, this one. And this user is, this user joined the admin group. Yeah, like, uh, like this. So 
then uh, test the API call. First, uh, we need to obtain the access token. So first, call the authorization endpoint of key clock, like this. This is the authorization request. Then show the login screen. So we are logging as the test user. Then uh, return the authorization code like this. We didn't prepare the client authentication, so a client application, so uh, we need to copy the uh, redirection URI. So then uh, we do the token request. Like this. The access token is like this. So we briefly check the access token. There are several uh, user attributes, but there is no uh, attributes uh, that indicate the uh, groups. Uh, for example, this user is uh, belong to the admin group. And also, there is a uh, subject claim uh, that indicate the uh, user identifier, uh, B5, blah, blah, blah. So I use this token to call API. succeeded and so I show you the log of OPA there are some log and the first receive request this is from nginx PEP uh, user ID is b5 blah 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 and resource type is hello and action is can read, and then uh, send the response to PEP, uh, result true. Yeah, like this. So yeah, uh, OPA integration is, uh, that's all, and uh, next, the uh, open FGA integration. In open FGA, I already defined the uh, some tuples, that is, uh, we have two tuples. First one is if the user is member of group admin, uh, the user can read resource hello too. And the second one is user B5 blah 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 is a member of group admin. So let's call the hello to resources. I use the same token and uh, call the hello to resource. Then the request succeeds. So the in OpenFGA integration, uh, we also uh, prepare the pro pro provision attribute features uh, using Rider API, and we implemented the. Uh, key clock uh, SPI provider. So I'd like to uh, verify the uh, behavior. First, uh, when in the test user currently uh, belong to the admin group, but change the group. Change the group to dev group. 
and read the admin. OK, so then call the uh, Hello to API. So the response is uh, for 03 forbidden. That is because uh, I show you again the tuples. Now, this first tuple is not changed, but this second tuple is changed. The user B5 blah, blah, blah is a member of group dev. This is uh, achieved by the key clock uh, SPI provider. So again, change the groups to the admin. Yeah, uh, the uh, API request will succeed. This is because the, again, the second tuple was uh, changed to this user is a member of the group admin. So the, okay, so move back to the uh, slides. And, and this is a summary of best practices. And yeah, I'd like to, uh, the last slide is just for your information. We are currently working on a project in the CNCF tag security to write a white paper on identity and access management to discuss best practices for authentication and authorization such as those introduced in this session. So if you are interested, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. And the second good news is that the CNCF tag security APAC region meetings have started every other week from August 21st. This is in a more friendly time zone for the security freaks in attendance today, so please join us. Okay, that's all. Thank you for uh, listening.